right? Coarse material. We have some intermediate black. We have some smaller red. And then we have some white sand. Good contrast, right? Can y'all see? Come closer. Let's just come right in here because I'm, I'm going to need you to look closer. <laughs> now, characterize these for a minute. We talk about the different shapes. How would you contrast this orange one with this red one? Okay, smooth, smooth versus rough. How do you produce a rough aggregate like that? Break. Break. You, you got to crush it. You got to break it. So this is a round, smooth stone, probably from a riverbed. It's been tumbled down by Mother Nature. This one is a very angular, crushed particle that was likely a manufactured particle. So we can achieve these different textures and roughness just in the manufacturing process. Okay, so Maggie, come on up close. Let's have you mix this up thoroughly. Question? Yes. Are these rocks so orange? I painted them. It took a long time. In fact, the smaller ones, like those red ones, they use like four times as much paint as the, as the orange one. There's so much more surface area, right? The coat. Better than individually painted. Yeah, they're they're spray painted. Okay. That looks pretty good. <laughs> so what we want to do is assume that this is now well mixed. Does it look pretty good to y'all? Not bad, right? There's a pretty good distribution of all those inside there. And so now we're going to simulate, if you will, the transportation of this aggregate to another place. And in order to do that, we need to load it up from its current place into a transport container. Okay, so Maggie, you've, cleaned, you've mixed it all up nice and even for me. See, you're left-handed, so Stephen, will you please hold this up for her? And she will load the container. Now, while she's loading, notice she's being very careful about holding the bowl, and she's getting nice, deep scoops with that trowel to, to try to fill it. We need to transport this aggregate. She's being careful not to spill any sand for the next class. Stephen, you might have to tilt it up just a little bit more for her. Just think of the other classes. Yep. I don't want to make words for the janitors. They're all friends of mine. Okay. But if they didn't have a firm bowl, she would get like a whole bunch of stuff from the bottom. Say Which, it again, Clay. Well, like, because when you're in the gravel pit, like, the trouble is if you dip your bucket down too low, you start scraping native soil underneath. And, right. Yeah, people get mad at you. Right. I showed you all the floor of that one stockpile up in Cache Valley. Very well maintained aggregate. But if you were to excavate too much, you'd go below the bottom of the pile and end up with native material, which up there would be clay. And as we say, a little clay goes a long way, right? Lots of surface area. <laughs> it loves water. Okay, so she thoroughly mixed this up and look what that happened. What is going on? Is it any longer perfectly mixed? No. No. Is this gonna be a problem for our construction site? Yes. Absolutely it will be. And there's a name for this problem. You thought we abolished it back in the 1950s or so. Segregation. Segregation. <laughs> yeah. This is called particle size segregation. And it's uh, it's still with us and alive today. We, we combat it every day on the job sites. Now, this is not the end of the problem, though. We're still not done. We're just in the transportation. It hasn't reached its final destination. Stephen, I need you to gently... Maggie, you can pull that bowl back now. I need you to gently create a stockpile with this material by holding it about 12 inches off the, the plastic and then just very slowly pouring it onto the plastic. Okay, Maggie, pull it all the way back and then those who are on that side kind of lift this up so that it doesn't splatter too much. Okay, nice steady hand, Stephen. About 12 inches high, go higher. Right about there. Okay, now just let that come out. So, is this a is this the way that we move? Um, is this the way that we move material a lot, where it comes down like, for example, a conveyor belt, and then it drops onto the top of a stockpile? Absolutely. This is a, a very common way of moving material around. And so, as he's doing this, are you beginning to see the development of any patterns? What are the patterns that you're seeing? Okay, he's in. 
man, all the all the coarse particles are way over here, and all the small particles are over there. Okay, why is that the case? What happened? Momentum as they come out. It's momentum. What's the equation for momentum? That's mass velocity. times velocity. These right here have more mass, so they have more momentum as they exit. They generate and they roll down the stockpile. So here we have a stockpile prepared. And um, maybe on average, the whole stockpile has the right gradation or particle size distribution. But the reality is this is going to be collected bucket by bucket. Let's simulate that. With some smaller unit volume, right? Y'all all seen the front loader that I showed you in the pictures. It's gonna come along, scoop out some of that, put it in the dump truck. It might need eight or so of those buckets, and then off it goes to the job site, which means there's a possibility that all of that or all of that could end up in a dump truck delivered on a job site. And if you wanted to have a dense graded material and you got that, you're gonna be happy? No, right? If you wanted a well-drained material, you got that, right? You wouldn't like that either. So none of this is exactly right. And so it's a problem. Now, one of the jobs of an engineer and technicians often working under the engineer is to inspect stockpiles and approve them for use on a project before anybody delivers this material to the job site and dump trucks. So, if you were to be the inspector, is it Donald? Yes. How would you inspect the stockpile? You would need to collect samples to take back to the lab. Tell me about some thoughts, everybody, about how you might sample this stockpile to get a representative sample that you could declare as being suitable or not suitable. Maybe take samples on different sides of it. Okay, this is important. He says, take samples from different sides. What else can you do in a different dimension? Up and down. Up and down. So you'll want to get some samples from the top, the bottom, around it, right, to get a representative sample. And so, Donald? Get us a representative sample. Take out your shovel. One of the challenges, by the way, of sampling a stockpile is as soon as you put your shovel into the side of it and you pull out the shovel, the coarse material from down low rolls into the spot that you just sampled. So you end up with all the coarser material always coming down. So one practice is to use a small piece of plywood and you push it into the, the stockpile sideways like this and then sample from underneath it to eliminate all that coarser material from, from coming down on you. Okay, so you got one sample there. Get another sample. There's where all the fines went, right? We can see that. And you need some other, okay? So if he were to do that, he'd get a pretty good representative sample of the stockpile, right? And he could take this back to the laboratory. And did the TAs talk to you about sieves and sieve analysis? You could run this through a system of sieves and then based on the weight of all of these particles retained on different sieves, you could determine whether it meets a specification, right? Now, if ever you did walk out to a stockpile and you saw one like this, you would reject it outright, right? You wouldn't need to go take representative samples because it has massive particle size segregation problems. It would need to already look to you to be uniform before you were to, to move ahead with some testing. Okay, well, thank you very much for your participation today.